certainly uh, good to be here and, and uh, sharing God's word with you is always a privilege. Uh, of course, uh, something that I've mentioned several times before, and, and if I'm blessed to uh, be able to mention it several times in the future, Chris had mentioned that uh, I leave that to the ladies that do the bulletin to pick out the scripture, and, and uh, it's uncanny, uh, a God thing, how oftentimes that that scripture lines up with my sermon and I give them no idea of what I'm preaching on. And, and uh, today that was the case uh, with Chris's words and, and the scripture as well, and, and of course what we're talking about with our world, uh, things going on in the world uh, as well. Uh, of course we know as our, elect, our country moves closer to election day, we see these our candidates, one of the big topics is security for our nation, uh, security for the world, uh, as it seems. And certainly we live in tense times, and a lot of folks are putting their hope into, into people and, and some that are elected and some that are appointed for their security. And I wonder if sometimes uh, we don't think about that ourselves. It's easy easy state to fall into, especially when you don't pay attention to what's going on around you. But uh, in Romans chapter 3, if you want to go ahead, and, or chapter 2, I'm sorry, rather, we'll see something here that Paul is teaching as well about that security. This morning's sermon title, I asked the question, where do you find security? And I asked that for us to ask ourselves as we look at this example that Paul uh, gives us in 17 through 29 of Romans chapter 2, and I'll read that and uh, just give you a little background on this. Of course, he's writing this to the Jews there at Rome, the Church of Rome, and uh, that's the, the focus of this portion. In verse 17, he begins and says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thou boast, thy boast of God, and knowest his will. And approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And are confident that thou art thyself art a guide of the blind, and a light of them which are in darkness. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that hast makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth if you keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, it is fulfill the law? Judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And we think about this as, as we read this, we think about security in the terms of the word that we really all understand. It really hits us where we live. We all want security, don't we? Uh, we want the, the comfortable sense of freedom that, that comes when we're confident that there is no threat of danger or trouble. And just to highlight what Chris had said, people a week ago, two weeks ago, had the security of being able to walk out and get in their vehicle and travel freely amongst where they lived to go and do what they wanted to do and go to church on Sunday and, and go to their jobs on the following Monday, uh, send their kids to school the following Monday. And that security that they had within the things of the world 
was wiped away with a storm. We have people that, that live and worship and around the world that does not have the security of safety to be able to assemble. And it's something that we take for granted many times, I believe, that word security. Security is the absence of threat, the absence of fear, the absence of danger, a comfortable freedom that says everything is under control. Another thing that we seek out is economic security, isn't it? We want to have enough stashed away, saved away, invested away, whatever the case may be. That if some tragedy happens, something befalls us we're not prepared for, that we do have that monetary security uh, that we can rely on. We also want to have job security for those of us that work. We go into our workplaces and, and we want that reasonable security that we're going to be able to advance and grow and, and make wages that we can support ourselves, our families with, without danger of being walked in and, and told one day that, hey, we don't need you anymore. So we seek out job security as well. Uh, marital security. We don't think about that term very often. Uh, but we all want the confidence that we're loved and beloved by a trusted, faithful partner. Uh, people want home security. Big business in the world today. Uh, burglar alarms and, and adding security systems. Sometimes people go buy big, mean, ugly dogs and they put out in a fenced yard. And, and sometimes I wonder if our kids aren't a bigger threat than the dogs are when they come in. So, But we want that security because it gives us that sense of well-being. Insecurity, on the other hand, is a killer. Insecure people tend to have psychological, emotional, and personality problems. And it's difficult to live in this world without some sense of security. Otherwise, you lock yourself away because you have no sense of well-being. The dictionary to define this says to be secure is the free from and not exposed to danger to be free from any apprehension any fear any worry or any doubt that'd be a pretty nice place to live i don't know that we've ever been able to live with that but in our minds we have security people want spiritual security too whether we realize it or not most people do uh, they want to be free from the anxiety of death. Not that anybody uh, wants to die or looks forward to die, but what I'm saying is the Christian, the person that has spiritual security, knows who their Savior is and knows where their eternity will be spent. And that's reasonable to think about that. Uh, we don't want to have to face God in judgment without Christ as our advocate, without Christ being our Savior. And to be, you know, the fear of our sins being counted for us and that security is brought through Jesus Christ and I think we would all understand and agree that as well so what we see here this morning is Paul's uh, dispelling really some fears or not fears but dispelling some some inaccuracies that the Jews had 17 through 29 and he actually destroys these false securities in this little passage and also outlines those false securities for us today because amazingly it has the, the parallels. We can see the same things within ourselves. And that's what I want to look at this morning. And he's dealing here with people, and we think about this, had the highest and greatest privilege. They were called the people of God, God's chosen ones, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. It was always before at that time. You said one, it was attached to the other. And I thought it was rather interesting, and before we get started into this, I went back and researched to see what uh, the percentages was. You know, I like to use Pew Research polls because they're very accurate and trustworthy on religious issues. And I went back and I researched re religious participation in Israel. Now, kind of naively, I thought, you know, they're probably are knocking it out of the park. 75, 80% of that nation still holds to this tradition of being Jewish, God's chosen people. But I was, sadly, I was surprised. Only 27% 27, 27 of the population in Israel 
go to church once a week or more. Roughly one-fourth. 39% go monthly, yearly, or uh, seldom, they would call that, that category. 39%. 33% never go. So you're looking at over 70% of the population of Israel that doesn't go to church but maybe one, or synagogue once a month. Some maybe once a year and others, I don't know how you could be more seldom than once a year. So the things that Paul is addressing now, we can see is rolling even over into today's society. That maybe they're relying on security in areas that are not so secure. And let's look at those. Verse 17, the security of heritage. And he starts this off uh, in verse 17. He says, thou art called a Jew. And now that's really what I was talking about with those percentages. When you call yourself a Jew, there was bragging rights there, so to speak, boasting. They were saying, in effect, by using this term, that they were better than everyone else because they're God's chosen people. But it's interesting how things have changed. They choose to call themselves really Israelis more than they call themselves Jewish, and they're more attached to the country than they are to their heritage as being God's chosen people at one time. So we see that it's still changed. They've, they've lost their Abrahamic identity. Paul identifies the fact that they call themselves and are proud to be called Jews. They figured in their minds they were better than everyone else. And that's really a basic problem among them. God called them and said that, that you're to go to the world and you're to take my message to them. And we know that's true because what Jesus said, said to the disciples who were all Jews, go ye into all the world. Right? And it was always to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And it would be that responsibility to spread that throughout the world. Sometimes we can fall into that trap too, can't we? We can fall into the trap of thinking, well, I'm a Christian. I've really got a leg up on those that aren't. And that's a bad place to be, folks, just to be frank with you. Uh, maybe a better attitude would be, I praise God because I am a Christian, that he had enough grace that allowed me to come to him through Christ. That might be the better attitude to take when we think about being a Christian. And there's nothing wrong, I'll say, let me back up about national pride with being Israeli. Nothing wrong with people feeling proud who they are. But it can be dangerous if we allow ourselves to think that because we have Christ as our Savior that we are better than everyone. And that's what I want us to think about. Jesus confronted this same type of attitude in the Gospel of John. He records it in chapter 8, if you'd like to flip over there. John 8, 31 and 32. And he's talking here about Abraham in this passage, true, the true descendants of Abraham. And Jesus then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, they go on even and, and ask him, you know, they said, you know, we're Abraham's seed. We're not under bondage. They didn't understand. They didn't really get it. Jesus said the truth will make you free. And the truth is about Jesus Christ as Savior. It's not about some kind of identity that you have. It's about who your Savior is, his identity. Because our nation will never save us. Being an American will never, uh, when we stand before God at his judgment throne, it's not going to be, oh, well, you're American, come on in. That's just not going to happen. It's, it's because of the blood of Christ, because of the sacrifice of Christ. But we have that in our country. We have people who think they're saved because they have that heritage of an American. We also have people that, sadly, draw their security in that they were taking the church as children. Uh, we have people that have that sense of security because they've, they consider themselves religious or spiritual. They have a sense of security because of some Christian roots that they had with the grandparents or great-grandparents or their family. 
but heritage, and that's what Paul is trying to tell the Jews here in Rome and Jesus uh, when he was talking to about the Abrahamic uh, heritage they had, that, that heritage does not equate to salvation. And that's what we have to understand. It's wonderful that we have a rich history of families in our community that have served God through church and, and been part of this body of Christ and other bodies of Christ. That's a wonderful heritage to have, but we cannot rely on security for the works and faith of our fathers. We can use it as an example, but we cannot rely on it for security. And that's what the Jews were doing. They were relying on their heritage uh, for security. And that's a bad place to be. Also in verse 17, he points out something else, that they had security in knowledge. He says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law. So they rested in the law. They lean on the law. And this, by the way, is a major portion of this passage, all the way now down through verse 24. As he goes through and, and, and he says, oh, so, so you've got the law. You're great keepers of the law. You're great teachers of the law. Uh, you lead the blind. You teach the babes, he says. Of course, that's me paraphrasing throughout this. But I encourage you to, to read that and let this sink into us. Basically, he's saying they had knowledge. No question about that. They have no question they had knowledge. They received the truth from God. And their confidence was that they were secure because they had the knowledge. Notice it's important that we think about how, what I'm saying here. They had the knowledge. And four points Paul makes here. What they've learned, what they've taught, what they did, and what they caused with that knowledge. See, having knowledge is a great responsibility. They had the truth of God. What is it that you learned? What is it that you taught because of that knowledge? What are you doing because of this knowledge? And what is it that you have caused because other people know you have this knowledge? And that's what he's talking about. If you look on down, he said, uh, you know, you're confident that you're a guide for the blind and a light to them which are in darkness. Instructor of foolish, teacher of babes, the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. Now there's the boasting part, you know. Therefore, which teacheth one another? Teachest thou not thyself? Now he's bringing it around, pointing, wanting them to look at themselves. You're preaching that a man shouldn't steal? Do you steal? Do you preach that you should not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? Do you preach that you should not worship idols, but yet you commit sacrilege yourself? And at that point there, you really have to examine yourself because if you look on that in verse 24, what's the result of this hypocrisy that we see? They had the knowledge. They're teaching the knowledge. But what am I doing with that knowledge? And then the, that question is answered, what has happened because of what I did? And it says that God's name is blasphemed because of what they did. Think about our nation today. Think about how the church, and I'm not talking about Locust Grove. I'm talking about the church as a whole as it is viewed in our nation. Let's go back now, and I'm going to ask these same questions that Paul asked the Jews. And I want you to think about, has there ever, have, how long has it been since you've heard of a scandal related to one of these things? Okay. Do thou preachest that a man should not steal, but thou steal? I've never heard of a of a ministry uh, fraudulently getting funds from, from people donating, have we? Do you say that a man should not commit adultery? Does thou commit adultery? Well, we don't hear about preachers having adulterous relationships. Uh, we don't hear about ministry teams doing things that would be considered adultery, fornication. See, the same thing's going on today. And the same, guess what? The same result happens today. 
because we have preachers in the pulpit that are, that are doing the same thing as Paul is telling these Jews or questioning these Jews about what they're doing. They're doing the same thing today and the same result is happening today. That people are blaspheming the name of God because of what the actions of these people who had the knowledge, who teach what they learned, but they did not practice what they taught. Do as I say, not as I do. We know that saying. And as a result of that, people, unsaved people, were blaspheming God. I don't need him. Look at them people. I'm as good as they are. They don't even believe. They don't practice what they teach me to do. Why do I need to go listen to them? So the same thing's going on today that was going on at the Church of Rome when Paul was writing this letter to the Jew. And it's something important for us to be mindful of. Because it's easy just to... To just skip over things like this and not even put much thought toward them. Because people look at us as Christians as examples. Well, Rob, you're laying a big heavy burden on me there. Yeah, I am. Because we may be the Christ that people know. Refer back to this. What have you learned? What are you teaching? What's the result of your teaching? You know what I'm saying? We tell people that we're Christians, but we also, in the same words, we, we say, but church is not that important to us. And, well, Rob, I've never said that to anybody in my life. No, you haven't with your mouth. But how many times have we done that with our actions when we don't go to church? Well, I've not been to church in several weeks, several months. Like the Jews, 27% go every week. 39% monthly, yearly, or seldom. Do you think that it would be, you could take anybody that's serious about their relationship with God if they seldom go and assemble together as the scripture tells us to do? I don't think so. See the same things today. And here's the thing about it, folks. Great judgment is reserved for those people who know the most. Those who know what the Bible teaches, know what God's word says, know what we're supposed to do, but do not act on it. And think about it. How much worse it would be to have that knowledge and have to stand before God and explain why you did not, why you did the same thing that Paul's writing the Jews about. Finally, there's another thing that, that's easy to get trapped up into in the modern world that we live in. In verse 25, talks about security because of ceremony. Now, all this passage from 25 down to 29 is based off circumcision. The Jews held great stock in this because it was part of the Abrahamic covenant. You go back into, into Genesis 17, I think it is, where, where God gives Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And that's how far back it goes. And they held great stock in this because it was one of the things, because of this covenant that God made with Abraham, it was the one of the things that tied the Jewish people to God and that promise. Again, much like being false security just because of heritage, here we see because of ceremony. They had this false security. And just to kind of summarize what he's saying here, he said, well, you folks are acting like uncircumcised people, and the uncircumcised people are acting like circumcised people. In other words, those inside the covenant are acting like that they're living outside the covenant, and those outside, inside. Pretty simple. We have all seen examples where a, a, someone that doesn't have any kind of relationship with Christ in a situation acts more like a Christian than a Christian does. And that's what he's talking about. And that's what we can't just rely on the fact that we come to church. We can't rely on the fact that, that uh, we maybe participate in some things. We can't rely on the fact that uh, we're faithful in what we do. Because you can do, just like the circumcisions described here, is an outward thing. Okay? It's just an outward thing. And he talks more about circumcision inside the heart as being an inward thing. 
And that's what we'll look at in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Inside. An inside change. An inside commitment. And that's what is important. It's what is required. It must happen. That's the sign of the covenant that we now have with Christ is a changed person because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Because of repentance of our sin, the acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as our Savior, the burial symbolism in baptism for the remission of sins or washing away of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that signifies the change. Living faithful until death signifies the change. Not that we just associate obedience more than some kind of outward sign. We can do all those things and still be a failure, just like they did. You know, they had all of the all of the stuff to back them up, the heritage. Oh, we're we're uh, we're we all fall underneath the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenants. We fall under all of those. And that's what I'm relying on. It's my outward and not an inward change. Lots of people that fall in that category today. They have that outward sign. Maybe we have some here today that falls into someone who is relying on their salvation because of a heritage. Maybe we have Christians that are going through the motions because of knowledge and a tradition. But they really don't have a relationship with Christ. And that's what I want to encourage you. Because we've got, as I've said, you're going to hear me continue to say, we have the holiday seasons coming upon us. We're most likely going to be in contact with more people now in the next three months than we were the, the last nine. Just because of the fact of, of gatherings and that sort of thing. Let's take the opportunity when we have that to be the best witness we can for Christ. But we have to work on ourselves first and make sure that we're not in the same shape as these Jews were. Relying on a sense of false security that will disappoint us someday. And let's be committed to Christ. Be committed to our relationship. And if you've never accepted Christ, if, you, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, if you've never repented of your sins, if you've never uh, been baptized, receiving the forgiveness of those sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and committed yourself to live faithfully until Christ returns or we're called away in death, I encourage you to do that today. With Now that you have the knowledge, why would you stop? Why would you not? Why would you delay it? Because as we have seen all too many times, with accidents, unplanned, unforeseen actions of other people, the power of God's nature, we are not guaranteed anything in our future. Tomorrow, we're not guaranteed this afternoon. Why would you have the knowledge for salvation and walk away gambling that you will have another opportunity? What's so important in between those two particular times that is worth your eternal destiny? What will happen from today until the time that you do accept Christ as your Savior? What do you think is so important that is worth that risk? Coming from someone who played that same exact card, I can tell you from experience, nothing is worth that. No activity is worth that. The most important thing that you can secure is your salvation. It can only be secured through Jesus Christ. As we look at this last slide here, Acts 4.12 is what this talks about, this scripture. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Period. 
Jesus is that name. Where are you at this morning? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. 168, I need thee. We all need him. We all need the Lord. We all need Jesus as Savior. We all need God as our Father. Will you accept Christ as your Savior this morning as we stand and sing the first and fifth verse of 168, I need thee.